very pleased that uh, we have such strong turnout. You know, Was Washington usually, you know, people show up for the first day and they usually skip the second day. And so I'm so grateful. But I think I know the reason for that, and that's because Joe Lieberman is here. Uh, and I want to say a sincere thank you to Senator Lieberman for coming today. Um, I, I know a little bit about what his life is like having worked in the Senate as a staff guy for 10 years and know how very, very precious time is. So for a senator with all of his obligations to find time uh, in the calendar to come to a think tank and speak to an intellectual issue is, is, is really a, a privilege and a rare thing now, sadly. But it's, it's, it may be untypical of the current Senate, but it is not untypical of Joe Lieberman. I mean, Senator Lieberman has consistently been a senator that thought his job was to bring new ideas and, and honest thinking to the Senate. And he's done that in a very refreshing way, and it's one of the reasons why he's such a respected leader in the Senate. It's one of the reasons we're going to miss him so much when he departs the Senate, because we've had with him there someone who thought uh, the quality of the idea and the honesty of the dialogue was the highest priority, not just the litmus test of politics. And uh, we're going to miss that. Uh, so I, but we're not going to let him escape from the policy orbit. We're going to make sure that he comes back more and more since he'll have a little more time. Although, uh, you know, every, everybody when they leave office tends to commit, overcommit. And so he's, he's wisely keeping his powder dried until he sees what his future world is going to be like. But we will want him back. And I know you'll, you'll understand that and hear that this morning when he shares with us his understanding of, uh, of uh, the South China Sea, you know, and, and I think, you know, our, our title here for this conference is Finding Solutions, really, and no one is more emblematic of, uh, of uh, leadership in government to find solutions than Senator Joseph Lieberman. Would you please welcome him with your applause, and we look forward to his remarks. Well, thank you uh, very much, John, for that uh, very generous introduction. I'm, I'm uh, delighted to be here. Uh, I always like to state that um, I'm retiring from the Senate, but I'm not retiring. And uh, I look forward to continuing to be involved in these discussions. As I think about it, I, I hope that uh, uh, my fellow Americans can uh, embrace, as I go on, a value that I consider to be uh, fundamental to uh, Asian culture, which is veneration of the aged, <laughs> and, uh, or at least respect uh, for the aged. Uh, I want to thank uh, John. Those kind words would be appreciated by me uh, from anybody, but uh, particularly from John Hamry, who's had a, an extraordinary career of service uh, to uh, our country uh, in a variety of roles, uh, uh, not the least of which has been his very strong and uh, progressive, constructive leadership of CSIS. Uh, I'm glad to be here this morning. I take it to be uh, a, a subject, for me, this is a subject of great uh, interest and importance. Um, I'm also impressed by the number of people here uh, who've come from around uh, the world, the quality of the people. But I must say in a way that perhaps you'll understand that it's particularly a unique and perhaps therapeutic opportunity to be here this morning because this is probably the only gathering in Washington this morning that's not talking about what the Supreme Court will decide <laughs> about the health care reform. <laughs> and uh, so it's a pleasure. If uh, I will warn you that if around 10 a.m. this morning you feel that the building is shaking, it is not an earthquake. It is uh, not literally. It's just that the Supreme Court has rendered its decision on the uh, health care reform law. I do want to thank all of you who have come to Washington from across uh, the Asia Pacific region to participate in this conference. I, I was in Singapore uh, a little less than a month ago for the Shangri La dialogue, so I know what a long flight. Uh, you had to make uh, to get here, and I appreciate very much uh, that you made that effort and took that time. Um, the very fact of this conference is a uh, testament to how much 
uh, our world and America's view of it is changing. Uh, just a few years ago, and I really mean a few years ago, I'd venture to say that there were very few people in Washington devoting very much time or attention to the South China Sea. Uh, this obviously is no longer uh, the case. Today, there is uh, a broad-based and bipartisan understanding here in America's capital that stretches from Congress uh, through the executive branch that the United States has very significant national interests at stake in the South China Sea. And that whether uh, or not uh, the disputes that are ongoing there are managed well will have strategic ripple effects far beyond uh, the shores of the South China Sea, in fact, uh, to America's shores. So I want to speak to you this morning about American policy toward the South China Sea, but before I do so, I'd like to step back just briefly and uh, offer a broader context for these discussions. President Obama, uh, to his credit, uh, I think, has made deepening the presence and engagement of the United States in the Asia Pacific, one of his signature uh, foreign policy priorities. In pursuing uh, this so-called rebalancing toward Asia, the Obama administration is building uh, upon a set of bipartisan commitments that stretch back decades to the very dawn of America's arrival onto the world stage, but much more recently back to the Clinton and the Bush administrations. From the normalization of relations with Vietnam under President Clinton to the path-breaking counterterrorism cooperation that was forged with countries like the Philippines and Indonesia after 9-11, uh, U.S. engagement in Southeast Asia has been on the upswing uh, for quite some time. Uh, American policy in the Asia Pacific is obviously rooted first in the reality that the United States is a Pacific power and that the freedom, security, and prosperity of the American people is inseparably linked to the freedom, security, and prosperity of the Asia Pacific. As former Defense Secretary Bob Gates rightly put it during his final appearance at the Shangri Dialogue in Singapore last year, and I quote, the commitment and presence of the United States as a Pacific nation has been one of the relatively few constants amidst the furious changes in the region over the past half century. End of quote. At the same time, uh, however, I do think that there is uh, obviously something different and significant that is taking place now uh, in American policy toward the Asia Pacific. We are clearly now devoting much greater diplomatic attention and energy to Southeast Asia, including, of course, the South China Sea. Uh, this part of the world. Uh, that receded from the forefront of American strategic considerations after the Vietnam War uh, is today, for a, a variety of reasons, ascendant uh, in American strategic uh, considerations globally. Uh, in this sense, I, I want to uh, suggest this morning that the United States is not just rebalancing to Asia. We are also rebalancing in Asia. And I said uh, rebalancing, not pivoting, because we, of course, remain deeply committed to our long-standing and historic alliances in Northeast Asia. We, 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 should, and, and, uh, we should no more pivot away from those relationships as part of a rebalancing in Asia then uh, we can pivot away from our relationships, for instance, in the Middle East, uh, as part of our rebalancing toward Asia. But, but what is different today <clears throat> is a sense, a real palpable sense, here in Washington that um, we have an unprecedented opportunity and really a responsibility to expand our partnerships and cooperation with the countries of Southeast Asia. 
um, there are possibilities that simply did not exist several years ago, either on a bilateral basis or through the increasingly mature uh, multilateral architecture of this region. Over the past six months, in fact, I've had the opportunity and the privilege to visit half a dozen countries that are members of ASEAN. In addition to Singapore, uh, I've been to the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, and Burma. Although the circumstances of each of these nations is of course different, one thing uh, they very much have in common today is a desire to strengthen and broaden their ties with the United States. And uh, it seems to me um, we have a, a similar desire uh, from our point of view. The question I think uh, we in the U.S. have to ask ourselves is whether we will have the good judgment, the vision, and the determination to do what is necessary uh, to realize uh, the historic opportunities and mutually beneficial opportunities of this moment. I believe that we've begun to do so. Uh, this is first, I think, thanks to the exceptional diplomatic leadership of our Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, and of her talented Assistant Secretary for East Asia and Public Affairs, Kurt Campbell, who I know spoke here yesterday. The Secretary and Kurt have maintained a high tempo of travel and personal engagement in the Asia-Pacific region, and especially in Southeast Asia. Whoever follows in their footsteps next year will need to match their example and make clear that the days of America's senior officials skipping summits in the Asia Pacific are over. But um, that's really the easy part. <clears throat> the harder part is making clear-headed decisions here in Washington that are gonna be necessary to build on these alliances and sustain our political and economic engagement uh, in the Asia Pacific. To me, um, that also means doing some things uh, here at home. Uh, it means getting our own fiscal house in order. In other words, adopting a bipartisan uh, debt reduction uh, program. And that means avoiding sequestration which is a word I, I trust you've had defined for you, uh, a term of art uh, in a small group of uh, fiscal managers here in Washington. And that in turn means that we will continue to be able to invest in military capabilities and force posture required uh, in a dynamic and changing uh, Asia Pacific region. It also means, I think, putting forward an ambitious, forward-looking trade agenda for um, the, re the region. It's often said that the business of Asia is business, but I will tell you that when it comes to free trade agreements, with perhaps one exception, the U.S. has for the last uh, few years hung out an out-of-business sign. Um, this is changing now with the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership negotiations, which I take to be a very hopeful new step in the right direction. I think we need to move forward on it as quickly uh, as we can. But uh, I believe we also need to take other bolder steps beyond TPP. For instance, and, and particularly because Burma has at last begun to open up and reform, it is time to put the idea of a U.S. ASEAN free trade agreement on the table and, and to begin to discuss it actively uh, with the members of ASEAN. As you well know, ASEAN already has FTAs with, among other countries, China, India, and Australia. ASEAN, from an American perspective, is a large market with a population of uh, approximately 600 million people and a collective economy that is the third largest in Asia. ASEAN is already the fourth biggest trading partner of the U.S. in the world with enormous potential for growth. Completion of a U.S. ASEAN FTA will of course not happen overnight. Uh, to begin with, it will require considerably greater progress toward democratic 
and economic reform in Burma. But what better way for everyone in the region and outside to stay invested in keeping Burma on the right track than making clear that a U.S. ASEAN free trade agreement will be one of the benefits uh, of doing so. And again, uh, it will be to everyone's mutual benefit. America's deepening engagement in Southeast Asia is, I think, also a geopolitical imperative. And here uh, I come to the question that is the focus of this conference, the South China Sea. A decade ago, when uh, security experts convened to talk about the future of Asia, the discussion was inevitably dominated by two flashpoints, the Korean Peninsula and Taiwan. Today, the conversation still includes those two, but it has definitely expanded southward. The U.S., uh, as you well know, is not formally a claimant in the disputes uh, that are ongoing now in the South China Sea. But what happens in the South China Sea matters greatly to us, and not just because uh, more than $1.2 trillion of U.S. trade flows through the waters of the South China Sea every year, or because of our longstanding commitment to upholding freedom of navigation and open access to the maritime uh, commons, which incidentally has um, been one of the reasons why the Asian Pacific region has experienced such explosive uh, and uh, progressive economic growth in the decades since World War II. Now, what happens in the U.S., uh, what happens uh, in the South China Sea also matters to the United States because the South China Sea uh, and the way in which the conflicts there are responded to is a test of whether the geopolitics of a rising Asia, Asia are going to be defined by win-win cooperation or zero-sum uh, competition. <clears throat> the way we handle um, these uh, conflicts is going to be a, a test of whether uh, the countries of the region uh, can resolve these differences peacefully according to international law uh, or through um, uh, coercion and force. And most important of all, I think in the larger picture to the United States and the region and the world, the South China Sea, really, and the, and the conflicts that are ongoing there now are going to provide a special and very important test for China itself, which is to say, how will Beijing relate to its neighbors as it grows more powerful? And in a larger sense, what kind of great power will China be in this century? The South China Sea is not primarily, however, about U.S.-China relations. It is about China's relations with its neighbors. But China's conduct in the South China Sea will inevitably affect its relations with the U.S. and just about everyone else in the world. And in this respect, what happens in the South China Sea really is everyone's business. When China pursues policies in the South China Sea that are heavy-handed or lack um, a clear basis in international law, it naturally creates distrust, increases the danger of miscalculation, and leaves China, I'm afraid, more isolated in the region and in the world. That's not an outcome that any of us should want, least of all the United States. On the contrary, the U.S. has for decades consistently supported China's integration into the global economy and the international system. We believe that has been good for America, good for China, and good for the world. America does not seek to contain China. We have no need to do so. As the foreign minister of Singapore recently said, the 21st century is big enough for both a strong and prosperous China and a strong and prosperous America. That's why I believe no country in the Asia Pacific should feel forced to choose between Washington and Beijing, but whether they uh, will feel forced to make that choice depends on 
uh, how the great powers uh, behave. Notwithstanding uh, these observations and what I take to be truths, I must say, as we gather today, that I'm concerned about China's behavior in the South China Sea. I believe it's pushing the region in the wrong direction and sending a um, message that is discouraging about what kind of great power uh, China will be and how it will relate to its closest neighbors. The overly broad scope, nature, and basis of China's claims are quite naturally for fostering a climate of uh, anxiety and driving other parties, most recently Vietnam and the Philippines, to fortify their own claims. Um, just look at the news from uh, Vietnam and Beijing uh, in, the, uh, in the media for the last few days. Uh, the lack of clarity, for instance, over the rationale for China's nine-dash line has been especially uh, unsettling, I think. It doesn't need to be this way. Uh, in the Asia-Pacific region itself, there are uh, significant and hopeful precedents for peacefully resolving disputes that are not that dissimilar under international law. And here I would cite uh, the resolution of, of, uh, of, of rather intense uh, disputes that existed between Malaysia and Singapore and between Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, rather than uh, uh, becoming a combat zone for 19th century like, like competition, um, the South China Sea should become a model for 21st century cooperation and mutually beneficial joint development of the enormous uh, natural resources under the sea in a way that benefits the people of the region and the world. To do so, however, I think certain principles need to be recognized by all. First, uh, because some of the claims of national sovereignty literally overlap each other, bilateral negotiations simply won't resolve all the outstanding differences. Uh, only by working together in a multilateral context uh, and preferably under some uh, third party uh, mediator or arbitrator uh, can the challenges of the South China Sea be addressed in a fair and comprehensive way. The first important step would obviously be for ASEAN and China to move as quickly as possible to agree on a code of conduct for the South China Sea and I'm sure you've been discussing that here in the last 24 hours. Second, all parties need to recognize that disagreements over the South China Sea can only be settled on the basis of international law. Trying to solve these disagreements on the basis of uh, dueling historic claims, by contrast, is a recipe for endless disagreement, continuing tensions, and the genuine risk of violence. Third, uh, we know from history that territorial disputes usually are very emotional for the people of the countries involved. And precisely for this reason, the countries that are involved in these disputes today need to exercise restraint and moderation. In this respect, I would say that the recent de-escalation between China and the Philippines over the Scarborough Shoal is a very hopeful development. Fourth, although the disputes over the South China Sea are clearly international, literally, in nature, resolving them will require uh, domestic reforms. I was uh, interested in the report of the International Crisis Group, for instance, that said that responsibility for the South China Sea within the government of the People's Republic of China is claimed by a number of different entities. Uh, as a result, it often isn't clear who's in charge, which makes management of disputes and de-escalation of conflicts more difficult. But it's not only China that needs to uh, do some domestic reform. The United States uh, needs to accomplish one major domestic reform with international uh, implications. Obviously, the first is the one I mentioned earlier, so I won't repeat it again, which is to get our own fiscal house in order. Uh, but the second is... Um, the, the pressing urgency for the U.S. Uh, to ratify the Law of the Sea Convention. 
this is one of the central messages that, not surprisingly, I took away from my own travels in Southeast Asia this year, and I'm hopeful that by the end of 2012, the U.S. Senate will uh, at last vote on this treaty and ratify it. I will tell you this morning that in my opinion, there are more than enough votes now in the Senate to ratify the convention. But the, the question is, um, because it's clear that the leadership of the Senate has decided to um, hold this vote up until after the election, whether um, some of my colleagues who remain zealously opposed to the convention will use uh, procedural uh, maneuvers to um, uh, stop the Senate from taking it up and working its will. I hope that doesn't happen. Finally, let me uh, close by offering a uh, prediction. Uh, as you know, the presidential campaign in the U.S. is now heating up. Uh, polls suggest that it's going to be a very close election, and I agree with that. Uh, I have no doubt also, as you've seen when, while you've been here and probably while you're at home, that in the months ahead, this campaign will provide, if nothing else, an excess of, in Shakespeare's term, sound and fury. Uh, but, <laughs> but, and hopefully a little light, but I'm confident there'll be sound and fury. Uh, but here is my prediction, uh, which I believe is relevant to our discussion this morning. When it's all over, regardless of which candidate emerges uh, the victor in the presidential contest in November, the basic direction of American foreign policy in the Asia Pacific, including, of course, in Southeast Asia and with regard to the South China Sea, will remain unchanged. In other words, there really is a bipartisan consensus on this particularly important aspect of American foreign policy. The importance of Southeast Asia and the South China Sea will continue to be recognized at the highest levels of the U.S. government. And my hope and my belief is that strong actions to implement that bipartisan policy consensus will also be taken by America's government in the years ahead, regardless of which party is privileged to lead it. Thank you very much. Can I cover you for a glass of water? I think I will, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Senator Lieberman, thank you very much for that thought-provoking overview of the uh, situation in a facing Asia, uh, including the South China Sea and the U.S. role in the region. I think you've given us a lot of food for thought, so we appreciate that. The senator has kindly agreed to take some questions. So uh, uh, if you have a question, please identify yourself. Keep the question short. Don't give a, don't give a sermon. And uh, away we go. Thank you. Ambassador, appreciate it. I'm Jose Pinchita, Philippine Ambassador. Uh, Good to see you, thank Ambassador. Thank you for your very insightful presentation, Senator Lieberman. In yesterday's um, discussions, um, two of these speakers had expressed concern that the discussions with regard to the Code of Conduct um, have not been going as with hope and that there is a concern that the Code of Conduct is going to be very similar to the Declaration of Conduct. It was signed in 2002. 2002. If, if that is the case, then people who are looking to the resolution of conflicts by uh, depending on the uh, well forging of a code of conduct between ASEAN and China will, of course, be very disappointing. So how is that going to play out then? Because if you don't have a code of conduct, these tensions will continue and, and confrontations may, may in fact lead to, to some, well, hopefully not, but some clashes in the, in the future. It's a very important question. So to say the obvious, which I touched on in my remarks, there, there are uh, dramatically different claims being asserted here, uh, both in terms of sovereignty over particular parts of the South China Sea and also the legal or historical basis uh, for those uh, claims. And uh, again, we've seen it just in the last week um, with the uh, assertions by uh, China, Vietnam, uh, 
adopting uh, domestic legislation that asserts certain um, uh, rights. Uh, the Chinese now, as you see through Sinuk, putting out uh, bids for um, uh, exploration development in parts of the uh, South China Sea uh, uh, adjoining Vietnam that would certainly seem under international law to be within its uh, territorial expanse. So there, there are very real differences here. Um, and I would say just briefly that there are two kinds of differences. The most immediate and pressing and potentially explosive are the claims um, of sovereignty uh, that clearly have to do with the, um, the potential for enormous natural resources under the water and, and the wealth that will come uh, from it. Uh, there's also then the related question which matters to us since we're not claimants in that regard, which is uh, if, if these claims are not settled um, uh, in, a, in a peaceful way under international law, the what we worry about, of course, is that if, if they're settled through bullying or coercion, to be as blunt as it can be, we worry about whether there'll be a temptation then to begin to compromise freedom of navigation, uh, which, of course, we would take as a, as a direct assault on, uh, on America. So uh, we've got a long way to go here from where we are right now. That's why I said the de-escalation of the conflict in Scarborough Shoal was very important. And I appreciate that President Aquino actually reacted. Uh, I think he handled it in a very uh, balanced and, and uh, sensitive way. Um, the, the code of conduct now gives us a chance to, in a sense, take the de-escalate, the most recent de-escalation um, uh, regarding the Scarborough Shoal and try to take that spirit as opposed to the I think rather aggressive claims uh, that, that China is making with regard to the Vietnam's uh, uh, sovereignty um, and, and put it into a code of conduct. And we can't expect too much of this. But if it's nothing but words, it's going to be very disappointing and will be a setback. And so what are we looking for? We're looking, I think, in the most general terms, for what I'd call a rules-based framework for resolving these differences. Now, hopefully, and this is a fundamental difference, we and most of our allies in this, along the South China Sea in ASEAN want to have this decided multilaterally. Uh, multilaterally, I explain why I think that's true. Second, we want it to be decided ac according to international law, most uh, ideally submitting to a, a third party for uh, arbitration and, and decision. Um, and so what I hope the Code of Conduct does is create a preface that leads us to that point. Now, um, my, my friends in the, our State Department are a bit more encouraged than, than the speakers that you referred to yesterday. They think that there is some progress being made, but um, maybe they have a diplomatic responsibility to be optimistic. So, of course, we'll see when that... Um, when that uh, uh, when, when the meeting occurs in uh, Cambodia uh, next month. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, my name is Dong Hui Yu with China Review News Agency. Uh, yesterday in Heritage Foundation, uh, the Congressman uh, Randy, uh, Randy Forbes uh, arguing that, argued that uh, China, uh, the United States should recognize uh, honestly and frankly, that China is a competitor. And you mentioned that the South China Sea has this uh, geopolitical implication to the United States. So do you think it's inevitable for the two countries to have uh, a strategic uh, competition in the South China Sea? You, you have been always uh, arguing that the US and China could avoid uh, war for energy by cooperation and dialogue. Correct. But how to manage the strategic uh, competition in the South China Sea to prevent the competition from escalating to the conflict in the future between the two countries? Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's a, a really important question and I appreciate it. So um, you're right, I, I'm, a, I'm an optimist <laughs> about US-China relations through this century uh, not just as a matter of faith, but as a matter of uh, practicality, and I think reality. 
I think that that both of these great powers have such uh, national interests in um, uh, managing our relationship in a way that's mutually beneficial that uh, it's going to happen. Uh, now, sometimes what's smart and sensible doesn't happen to, between countries, and they end up in conflicts, but uh, I don't think that will happen with us. So I, if there are clearly ways, non nonetheless, in which China and the U.S. will compete, but I think it, it will be and sh must be uh, a kind of peaceful, mutually uh, respectful competition. I mean, we compete with some of our uh, foremost allies. Um, we have intense competitions, for instance. I'm talking about business competitions with some of our closest allies in Europe, and they arouse uh, great emotion here. They lead to, for instance, Buy American provisions that um, pass through Congress, and they're, they're quite often not related, as you might think, to China. They're related really to uh, uh, European defense companies that are competing with uh, European governmental support for American contracts. So I cite that as an example of, of competition. But look, um, the more I'm involved in matters of foreign policy, the more uh, they seem to me, and I know this is simplistic, that, that they seem to, that, that uh, the more I believe that we can um, uh, learn from our personal relationships how to have good relationships between nations. And um, this begins with the, enough mutual respect and trust to be honest with one another and uh, n uh, not to fall into uh, the vagaries of diplomatic language, but to be very direct with our friends in, in China to talk about what their interests are in the South China Sea to explain why what our interests are and what our allies' interests are there and to uh, see if we can't find a way to solve, the, solve these problems in a mutually beneficial way. Lord knows if the estimates, and I understand that China's uh, a very urgent need for energy as, uh, in, a, in a very large country, but um, if the estimates of the actual gas and oil reserves under the South China Sea are accurate, if I may use uh, an American colloquialism, there's enough to go around. Um, th there's plenty there, and, and rather than get into a, f a fight over it, we ought to be able to figure out a way that we can all benefit from it. So I, I, I apologize if that was general, but I, but I actually mean it in that way. We just gotta, uh, we've got to be respectful of each other's domestic um, priorities and also acknowledge that if we get into a real conflict, it's not only bad for the world, but it's very bad for each of our countries. Yeah. Larry? Yes. I'm uh, Larry Nix from the CSI, as Senator Lieberman. Uh, the United States has begun to supply some maritime military equipment to the Philippines. Yes. And at least one key U.S. ally, South Korea, is negotiating with the Philippines over the sale of jet fighters. Are there any plans or is there any discussion in the Senate Armed Services Committee to have the committee take a closer look at this, to look at uh, <clears throat> the kind of uh, maritime presence the Philippines uh, should maintain in the South China Sea, excuse me, <coughs> and also uh, what kind of military assistance and training program United States ought to have with the Philippines in order to support whatever kind of appropriate presence the Philippines ought to have out there? Uh, the answer is uh, yes. I mean, just generally speaking, as you probably know, although, well, the uh, Armed Services Committee in Congress uh, actually asked CSIS to do a, uh, a study of uh, um, uh, and make some recommendations of, um, about American um, force posture and uh, our overall strategic policy in the region, although that's focused particularly on some of the um, discussions about uh, that are unique to Japan. But um, uh, there's no question that, that uh, we're into discussions with the Philippines, the Armed Services Committee is interested in it, um, which are aimed 
particularly to give them some greater defensive capabilities. I mean, obviously, we have a, mutually def a mutual defense treaty with the Philippines, which matters to us. It's, it's real. It's a matter of an inter uh, a national obligation that we have. Uh, but our hope is that uh, we can strengthen the Philippines defensively so that uh, no one um, r runs the risk of, of uh, trying to take advantage of the Philippines. And a lot of this is to give the Philippines a, a better um, sort of sense of awareness of its maritime uh, environment. Um, I, I must say to you uh, that, that uh, when you look at this, uh, it, it's not, uh, there's no basis in fact to get overly uh, anxious about it, for instance, for China. I mean, today, as I recall, uh, if we, uh, that our, where's we, check me on this, that our, our defense aid to the Philippines it runs about $30 million a year. Now, that's a very small uh, amount. So, um, uh, but generally speaking, I will say this, um, and, and your question evokes this response. As part of the rebalancing uh, of uh, U.S. foreign policy toward the Asia Pacific, as you know, and I'll just so I'll say it briefly, um, and Secretary Panetta um, made this very clear and specific in uh, in Singapore at Shangri La, that. Um, uh, we are committing more of our naval presence uh, to the Asia Pacific region than before, and um, we are we have entered into some agreements, not for bases for American bases in the region. That that's not going to happen anymore. And what you're going to see, I think, uh, and this depends on the bilateral relations we have with our allies. You're going to see um, more rotational presence of American forces, such as uh, has begun in the north of Australia. As you know, four uh, lit littoral combat ships um, will be uh, uh, sort of stationed out of Singapore by the end of this uh, decade. And, and uh, how much further this extends uh, depends, obviously, in the first instance, on the countries in the region. But I think, I hope, the, and I believe I'm reflecting the feeling on the Armed Services Committee of the Senate that we will be responsive to the extent that we're able to the desire of our allies in the region, including in the, uh, in the ASEAN, to uh, um, work with them to guarantee their own security. Okay, one last question. I, maybe we should let a, a journalist ask the question. That wasn't my choice, of course. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm teasing, go right ahead. Okay. My name is Hien Ngo from The Voice of Vietnam. I have one yes. question for you. You have mentioned that uh, any miscalculation in the South China Sea will lead to the uh, escalating tension, maybe violent in the South China Sea. What do you comment on the uh, event that China oil company uh, called for the bidding on the nine blocks within the economic zones of Vietnam? Yeah, well, this is the kind of action that um, if, you, if you take it literally, which we have to, I mean, I always say when people say things or do things, there may be a political explanation, but nonetheless, you've got to take it literally because the people who do them may actually mean them. Uh, and if you start to speculate beyond the statement, uh, you really have no basis because you better take the statement. But on its face, it's, a, it's in my respectful opinion, an unprecedented and unfounded claim that's within an economic zone recognized by international law that is Vietnam's. And um, so, as you know, there's some speculation that the, um, that either the PLA or some other uh, force in the foreign ministry in Beijing has asked the Chinese National Oil Company to make this claim as a part of a, a kind of rhetorical um, combat that's going on now, but it's, uh, it's quite provocative, and, and a response to the Vietnam asserting its own uh, legal rights by, by domestic law just last week. But this is exactly what has to stop, because as these kinds of rhetorical provocations go on, as I said in my remarks, um, notwithstanding people speculating about what the real motivation of these comments is, and it may be in the China case even more domestic politics than, than international, it's quite provocative. And um, this has to stop really on all sides, and it's why, uh, this is a good note to end on, why, um, going back to the first question, it's really important that 
ASEAN's uh, work on, on a code of conduct for the South China Sea uh, produces something real that creates a, a regional de-escalation that can lead to the kind of cooperative, mutually beneficial, peaceful resolution according to international law of these quite real disputes before they lead to misunderstandings and what is always the risk that they will stop being rhetorical and actually begin to be violent. And that uh, would be in no one's interest, certainly not in the interest of the country uh, whose Congress I'm, I've been privileged to be a member of. I thank you very much. Your questions were very good, and, and I, I thank you for being here to uh, be part of this conference. Have a good day.